He is a legend in sports media, more than 20 Emmy Awards, and has worked for just about every major sporting network. In addition to being a legend in his own mind. <laughs> yes, which is why we have him on here today to talk about that and a career that has worked on several Olympics, World Cups, America's Cup races as well. We're going to talk about it all. And let's not forget that this Jeff Mason is an avid sailor. So we're going to learn more about him professionally, personally, what drives him and why he is so giving with this time and is so big about helping others along the way. I'm Brian Fenley. I'm a national anchor for Fox Sports Radio. This is the On to Something podcast. Super excited to have you on, Jeff. And as you look at your career and spanning what you've done, and we'll touch upon this as we get this conversation going, but what, in terms of the version of you right now, to the version of you as a runner for ABC in that big chunk of time, what is unchanged about you today to a young Jeff Mason just getting into the business? Wow, great question. Uh, I hate it when interviewees say, that's a great question. I hate <laughs> it when say, that's why he's making the big bucks, Jeffrey. It's a great question. This is what he's paid for. Um, I think the, the the thread of continuity in my life and in my career has been, I, I have a real passion for what I do. I was blessed to fall into sports television. Um, and that's not a bad, uh, that's not a bad career path to fall into, obviously. Uh, but I work real hard at it. Um, you know, it's not good if you're trying to conserve your marriage, if you're traveling 500,000 miles a year all over the world. Uh, that's, that's not exactly healthy. Um, but, you know, I love what I do. I work hard. I uh, am not afraid to um, help others learn from what I do. Uh, and so I guess, you know, I guess passion for what I do has really carried me both personally and professionally, to where I am today. On the lines of that passion, we mentioned this in the introduction, but you being an avid sailor, you being on the water, and certainly you've covered a lot of sporting events that are on the water, but for you, even when it has nothing to do with work, you love to be on the water. What does being on the water do for you that nothing else does? Being on the water, and I grew up in a, uh, in a place uh, in New England called Marblehead, Massachusetts, uh, and sailed there for decades. Being on the water is, used to be, I don't do it much anymore because I'm too old to <laughs> be competitive. <laughs> um, but being on the water helped me escape uh, just to get out of uh, the hustle and bustle of our, of our world, uh, of my fast paced world that helped me sort of get away from all that. But it also helped me answer my competitive instincts. I, I very seldom would hop in a boat and just go sailing. More often than not, I was going sailing to go racing. Um, and that eventuated in uh, being on Nefertiti in the America's Cup. Um, so it answered all my instincts to sort of you know, take a deep breath and get away, smell the fresh air. Um, I've been on the water all my life, grew up here in Florida back in the 1940s on the water. Um, so I love being on the water and, and sailing for me has answered my, uh, my competitive instincts uh, that are now answered not by sailing anymore, but by playing racquetball three or four times a week. So I don't know, I just like to be competitive. And I guess that that that's probably another element of the first question you asked. I could have said that, you know, passion. Yes. But I like to be competitive. And when we were fighting to be heard and to be respected as a young organization in the old days of ABC sports, when there were only two or three shows a week uh, about sports uh, that carried us through, we worked really, really hard uh, to do good, to do good TV uh, to cover sports the way they should have been covered, to cover stories about people, 
uh, and that helped elevate us. So working hard and being competitive and, and being passionate. When, and on that note, Jeff, you touched on this a little bit, but when have you had to vouch for yourself the hardest? Had to have been your best advocate, stood up for yourself the most in your career, specifically, perhaps I would think at the beginning of it, as the business was evolving and progressing, and you were on the forefront of its growth. We were uh, on a small team of people that bonded together because of our friendship and respect for each other um, for our, and, and because of our shared experiences. Um, I never really thought about it as having to prove myself, although there came a time in 1983 when I had to make a decision for myself in order to uh, retain my self-respect. I realized to my horror that I had, uh, under the guise of hard work and playing hard and working hard, I had developed a dependency on alcohol. And so I picked up the phone and uh, went to Betty Ford in 1983. That was, I had never really thought of it that way, but the way you asked the question, I suspect that's the answer. I had to, I had to decide to uh, respond to myself uh, and to become whom I really was as opposed to whom I was trying to be. Um, and so on that, that day that I walked in the front door on September 15th of 1983, that's when my life began to have meaning and substance and, and truth. Uh, and ever since then, it's been much better. There's no question about it. I was winning Emmys and, and having people write columns about me and being on radio shows and so-and-so and so-and-so. Uh, but oftentimes I was in an alcoholic blackout. Uh, I produced several hours, oh, several hours, dozens of hours of coverage in the early 80s from Wimbledon for NBC Sports. To this day, I have no recollection of being in London for that trip. I was what they call a blackout drinker. So did I have to declare for myself? That's a roundabout way of answering only when I realized that I, I had to stand up and be counted for myself. Once I did that, it's been pretty, it's been pretty good ever since. In tapping into who you are, realizing what you need to work on and being loyal to yourself and making that huge professional and personal move ended up affecting you professionally and personally in 1983 to get the help that you needed. How have you been so committed to sobriety ever since when that is not an easy thing to do, but the way in which you're wired how have you been able to do that? It's my way of giving back. I was blessed to get to know Mrs. Ford uh, the night I got out of treatment. Uh, and we worked closely together uh, on a number of projects for many years. And she put me on her board of directors. And I was, I was honored to be asked by her to be one of her eulogists at her, at her memorial service. Um, so I will never be able to pay her and her team of professionals back for how they helped me find my way back to myself. That's how I, that's how I come at it. I, I spend quite a bit of time working with addicts and alcoholics um, and I, I do it A, because I love it, because it makes me feel relevant uh, and helpful. We all wanna feel relevant and helpful, but I feel it because I, I just owe so much to those who 38 years ago helped me find my way. And so I'm blessed to be able to have the time and the energy to give back. Um, I don't do it to, I don't wear it uh, on my sleeve. I, I just, that's what I love to do. And when I get in rooms with patients who are trying to find hope, just as I was many years ago, I see in their eyes how much it means to them to listen to someone who's been there before and who can 
uh, who, who can discuss with them how much better it can be. Everybody gets, uh, everybody gets off on something. That's what I get off on. We're talking with Jeff Mason. I'm Brian Fenley. How far have you taken this desire to help in terms of the most drastic measures you've taken to help somebody in a time of need? Brian, I get a lot of calls um, from friends, family, acquaintances, colleagues, you name it, who are looking for guidance as to how to address issues uh, in, in the fields of addiction and, and um, you know, and alcoholism, mental, mental health uh, that they're facing. Um, and so hardly a, I don't know, hardly a, a, a short period of time goes by when the phone doesn't ring, you know, maybe every two, three, four weeks, I don't know, when someone uh, reaches out and asks for some, some support and, and some guidance on what steps to take. I've been at it a long time. So I understand how to respond to those needs. And they're all always different. Everybody's needs are different. Uh, and in the course of working with Mrs. Ford and, and the board in the treatment field, I've come to know a lot of uh, real players in the field, <clears throat> excuse me, who are, are uh, professionally gifted uh, in terms of helping people find hope. Fortunately, I know who they are and I know where, uh, how to reach them. So I'm able to funnel people who are looking for hope into uh, a wide variety of, of locations where I believe they can find hope. I'm not a clinician. I'm not, I'm not gonna get anybody sober, but I can sort of help point them in the right direction. And as I become the connector in that regard, that gives me, that gives me a really good feeling. You've also pointed people in the right direction as far as what it takes to put together good sports television. Jeff Mason is with us. I'm Brian Fenley. And on that note, how have you been a better producer, director, executive ever since you made that personal decision to go to Betty Ford? How has that changed your approach to the business of sports media and the way that you view it? When one restores one's self-confidence, when one learns that it's okay to be oneself and not try to be funny, famous, whatever, when you don't try too hard, so hard to be somebody, if you're, if you're, if you're blessed enough as I was 30 plus years ago to understand, to be taught, that it was okay just to be myself, to trust my instincts, to not be too artificial, to not try too hard, but just to be myself, to go with my own instincts about, about whom I am and what I do professionally. It's just made it a lot easier. I'm not saying I'm any better than the next guy who produces a football game or the America's Cup or an Olympics, uh, but I'm comfortable understanding that, that my instincts, which, have, which I've acquired over the years, have stood me in pretty good stead. Two cases, uh, for example, I mean, the horrible day in September of 72, yes. when we were in the broadcast center in Munich, um, and literally uh, steps away from our studio, uh, the hostages um, were taken and ultimately they were all, uh, they all died. Uh, during the Olympics. Uh, that was a long day. And we had no experience covering anything like that. Those of us who were in the control room with Rune and Don Olmeyer and, and people like that. So we were, we were just going on sheer instincts. Um, the, the earthquake during the World Series in San Francisco. You know, there are times when you have to rely on what feels good, what what I believe I should do. I'm not always right, but I've learned over the years to trust the instincts that I've acquired over the years in order to make rationally, reasonably good decisions. Um, that's how I apply whom I am to what I do. 
And, you know, I'm 81 years old. I've been at this a long time. So, you know, I've been in the business over 50 years and I'm blessed to have learned uh, a lot of good lessons therefrom. But more importantly, I am superbly blessed to have had the opportunity to work with people in this industry, the very best that ever lived. Jim McKay comes to mind, uh, Howard Cosell, Rune Arledge, Chuck Howard. I, I, you know, I've worked with the very best that ever lived in this industry. And so we've all learned together because the industry, you know, a bunch of years ago didn't really even exist, but now Lord knows it's exploded. Uh, and those of us who've been around for quite a period of time, do have things we can help the, the younger generation learn uh, and enjoy the experience of being in this industry. So <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm blessed to have been around for a long time, to have worked with so many really, really good people, but I also enjoy telling stories <laughs> about some of those people and some of those experiences, but I enjoy helping young people. I, I do a little bit of work out at Florida Gulf Coast University uh, here in Fort Myers, um, and I'm enjoying helping them understand the best ways for them to access the kinds of uh, industry experiences that I've been blessed to have. So it's, it's, uh, it's a good feeling. I, I, I really enjoy it. And I hope great. to do it for a long time. Absolutely. One of the great idols in the industry, I love how Leslie Visser summed you up. Quote, he is a combination, Jeff, of courage, grace, and stamina close quote. And if I were to go back to, you touched upon this for a moment in Munich in 1972. What about that saga do you find replaying most in your mind when you go back to dealing with the horrors of that day? It's not easy. Um, <clears throat> I had on a walkie-talkie radio, the other end of that walkie-talkie radio was a guy named Marvin Bader, <clears throat> who was my partner in this whole Olympic venture for many, many years. He was sitting in the office of the press chief uh, of the Munich Olympics. Uh, and they had developed such a friendship that we knew we would get all the correct information before literally anybody. <clears throat> and I remember hearing the uh, walkie-talkie go on and Marvin said, Mace. And I said, yes, what do you have Marvin? And he took a deep breath and he said, they're all dead. And I said, <clears throat> Marvin, what did you just say? He said, Mace, they're all dead. And I said, I'm gonna tell Rune who's sitting five feet away from me, can I go with that? And he said, you can go with it. And so I hit the switch to Rune's ear five feet away. And I said, Rune, I just heard from Marvin and they're all dead. And he turned around and he said, for sure. And I said, for sure, you can go with it. And he hit the switch in front of him and he turned into Jim McKay's ear and said, Jim, they're all gone. And that I don't need to tell anybody was a momentous, a real moment in the history of our industry. Um, that's what I remember. I remember that moment clearly. I remember where I was sitting. I almost can remember what I was wearing. Um, and the next thing I remember is going back to the hotel, however many hours later, that was at the end of a really long day. And Olmeyer and I went back to the hotel and we had connecting rooms. And uh, you know, we walked into the room and he came into my room and sat down and we both just had a really good cry. Um, that's what I remember. And I don't articulate that very often and it's, you know, it's, it's hard to do, but that's what I remember. Um, it made, having that experience made me a better person. I, I, learned, I learned quite a bit about whom we are and and rather than just telling stories of people who were throwing balls and hitting tennis balls and diving into water or whatever, it made me understand whatever we do, at some point, we can perhaps have an opportunity to have some impact on the people around us. And we, we had an opportunity that day to tell the truth, to tell the story of what was happening to millions of people live. 
Um, and we did a good job. And so that's, that's what I carry from the extreme sadness of, of what happened, but the pride uh, that we all acquired from having done a good job. And of course, there are so many prideful moments from, from your career and sort of switching into something that happened a little bit later on from 1972, when you got to work with David Hill at Fox and putting together the NFL studio show. It's really cool. David has been on with me and it's been an honor to be able to hear his version of how he was able to launch things. How did you play a big role and what did that look like when you were building up that platform? I would gotten to know Hilly years before uh, when we were both covering Wimbledon, he for channel nine, uh, and me for NBC. So we got to know each other in London uh, and we had common friends there. And then when it came time to do the America's Cup in uh, Fremantle, uh, I called upon him and we got together again uh, and became very close friends. Uh, me and my son, parenthetically, spent two Christmases in D David Hill's home in Sydney, only because that was the travel schedule that matched up. Uh, and so when you spend Christmas in somebody's home, you get to know them pretty well. So I've, I've for many years felt like family in the Hill household. Uh, Hilly and I are very close. And uh, he is maybe the smartest person I've ever worked with, I've wow. ever known. Um, he has instincts for television. Uh, he gives credit to Arledge all the time. And, and I put him right there with Arledge. Uh, Hilly, knows, Hilly knows what works. Just, just as Rune did, uh, in addition to having a great sense of humor, um, he's not afraid to, uh, he's not afraid to uh, take risks. So when he called me and asked me to help him launch the studio show uh, with those classic guys, I, you know, it was, it was one of the more fascinating experiences I've ever had. And we started literally a napkin on the, on the table. Uh, I had called him actually to make, I was the first one to tell him that Fox had gotten the NFL. We were at the uh, World Cup draw in Las Vegas. And I had been on the, and Hilly was in London. And I'd been on the phone with Hilly off and on for, you know, what do you think is going to happen in the NFL? So when I, somebody called me in, in, in uh, Vegas and said, guess, guess who got it? Fox got the NFL. I dialed my phone right away. And Hilly, I mean, I woke him up. It was the middle of the night in London. I said, Hilly, it's the mace. I'm here to tell you your life will never be the same. And he said, what do you mean? I said, welcome, sir, to the NFL. You are now the proud owner of the National Football League in America. Good luck, bon voyage. And there was a stunning silence. And he said, thanks, Mace. Thank you. Um, and he just today, got signed on to be a consultant to the new golf project that Greg Norman is involved with. Um, Hilly, Hilly, Hilly is uh, ageless, timeless, um, supports his friends, maybe more so than anybody I've ever known. Loyalty is what he does. But, you know, as we, as we work together to put that show on the air and, and as we've talked about things ever since, he's just, he's just not afraid to make a mistake. He's not, he, he, is, he is boundless in his enthusiasm, but in his ability to take risks. Doesn't fail very often, but uh, working with him is like being in the, in the center of a, of a typhoon. You never know what's coming next, but generally speaking, A is going to be fun, B is probably going to work, and C, it's going to, it's going to be around for a while. Uh, and he working with some very, very talented people, Stan Honey and that group, uh, the glowing puck and hockey, you know, the, the uh, first and 10 line. I mean, there's so many things that Hilly has been part of. Um, and, you know, he's not getting any younger, but he just took on another big project. So Hilly and I, we basically believe we're just going to keep going until we can't go any further or more. Um, he's the best. He is absolutely the best. And, you know, he can, uh, he makes everything he touches better. He spent a year or so 
several years ago, helping the F uh, Formula One reinvent itself. Uh, and he almost killed himself going to Formula One race all over the world every week or every other week. Uh, and, and I remember talking to him throughout that project and it was hard, it was really hard. You know, we're not getting any younger and the travel and the hours and the, you know, the time zones and all that. But when he left that project after whatever, a year or two, it was infinitely better than when he arrived. And that's what he did. He, he did then and he does now make everything better that he touches, um, personally and professionally. And so uh, I'm, I'm blessed to be, to have him as a close friend. Whatever he touches gets better. Whatever you touch as well gets better. Both of you guys are workhorses. And that's what's made both of you so successful is the amount of hours that you throw yourself into projects. How do you deal with that? And then also deal with the health of it because like you pointed out some of these projects there's an incredible amount of travel there's a lot that drains you and both of you have this gung-ho mindset that's made you so successful but having that but also being aware of your health how do you deal with that back and forth i didn't really start being aware of my health in terms of the travel until the beginning of covid on March 11th, when my travel, which at, to that point, when I was working at Eurosport on the, uh, on the Korean Olympics, uh, Ken Agar and I worked together and we were averaging three, 400,000 miles a year back and forth to Europe to the 11 markets that Eurosport controls in terms of, of, of that Olympics project. Um, and, you know, you don't think about it until you stop. At least that, that's, that's how I have always operated. Um, I tra it was whom I was, it's what I did. And I never really thought about it. But I have to tell you in the, and we're almost a year, two years from that day uh, where everything stopped, I can't any longer imagine myself doing what I did. Wow. Um, the, the, whole, the whole idea of going you know, getting a ticket, going to the airport, checking in, having to wear a mask, connecting. I'm not familiar with airports anymore because I haven't been in airports basically for two years. The whole process is, an, is a real intimidation to me now. Uh, and I'm glad I don't have to do it. Do I miss some things about travel? Absolutely. I spent my life going to the greatest places on the planet and being with the greatest people <clears throat> Excuse me, in the world. And I miss that now but I don't miss the exhausting commitment that I made to myself. I am blessed to have my health. I've had a couple of, you know, a couple of uh, issues with my health, but I'm healthy as can be now. Uh, and I, I have a firm belief that the reason I'm as healthy as I am is because I kept, I kept moving and I kept working and I kept, yes. Uh, I, I just kept at it and I haven't allowed myself to, you know, until recently, the last couple of years, I haven't allowed myself to take a deep breath. Um, the, the more I am mentally, the more I am physiologically, the better I seem to be. Um, I'm coping now with some issues of boredom. I, you know, I, I don't exactly know how to handle boredom because I've never really had boredom in my life. I'm learning and I have a great wife who's very supportive and, and, you know, Team Mason is, is great, my, my son and my brother, but, but travel was and is really taxing. But I didn't know it until it stopped. I didn't really even think about it because it's what I did. It's what I did. And so uh, it's, it's different now. It's healthier now, in my opinion, at my age. Um, and when I see people who are sort of still into that, when I talk to them on the phone or whatever on Zoom, you know, I, I occasionally remind them, enjoy it while you have it, but don't let it get out of kilter. Don't let it kill you. Don't let it, you know, just chill. Do it rationally. And uh, I, I've really been blessed with experiences and people uh, in, my, in my life, in my world 
more so than anybody I can imagine. I, I really have I've been blessed. To see that outlook change and then for you to bestow that on others, which is really hard for some to sort of come to terms with. And I want to leave you with this final question. Jeff Mason is with me. I'm Brian Fenley. How do you, at this stage, stimulate your mind in what this business is doing and changing and how you are still at this point learning about the business? What does that look like for you? Well, I am blessed to be uh, employed now uh, full time by uh, PPI, uh, which is a uh, which is a labor relations and labor supplying company, uh, the biggest in our industry. Um, I'm on the board of directors and I'm a consultant to Bob Carzoli and his team, um, and and we are in constant touch with every element of sports production. Uh, here in the U.S. in that we supply over 80% of the people who do the the below-the-line sports production, technicians, et cetera. So in order to be able to connect my new colleagues, and I've been with them now for just about a year, in order to connect them with people in the industry who I think can help them grow, help us grow, um, I have to keep my, my finger in it. I have to keep my hands on, on the wheel, as it were. Uh, and Jerry Steinberg and I joined this company together, and we talk almost every day. And between the two of us, there probably aren't too many people in this industry that we don't know. We, can't, you know, we can pick up the phone and call virtually anybody. Well, in order to be relevant and in order to maintain uh, my value with PPI, I got to know what's going on. And this industry, as you well know, Brian, is, is literally upside down and it changes literally every day. And there are acquisitions and, uh, and, and decisions being made vis-a-vis uh, -vis where companies are going to go and who they're going to buy and who they're going to sell to and who they're going to align with. If, you, if, you know, if, if, if fatigue is an issue, don't get in this business today. Because it is, it is, there is never a dull moment. And I am so lucky to be able to sit here in Naples, Florida on a Zoom call with 99% of the meetings I take um, without having to get on airplanes and go all over the world. Uh, so in order to, to be relevant, in order to continue to make a contribution, A, to the industry, because I'm on the Hall of Fame committee and things like that. In order to make a, a, a contribution to my industry, which I really enjoy doing, you got to keep up with what's going on. So I, I read a lot, we talk a lot, and I don't know of a more, uh, what's the word? I don't know of a more vibrant industry now uh, that I'm aware of uh, than sports TV. I mean, it is all over the planet. Things change every, there's a headline every day. Uh, and so in order to keep up and, and maintain my value, I got to, I got to stay connected and A, it's fun, but B, it requires a lot of effort. It's terrific. So thanks That's, for the question. Absolutely. Never a dull moment in your career, which oh. goes back to how we started in that metaphorically, you have been not just an avid sailor, you know, verbatim but also in the world of sports media and riding the the at times rocky waves that it can be on the waters but no better captain of this industry than you jeff jeff mason i'm brian fenley jeff thanks so much for for sitting down and telling some stories it was a true honor to be able to have this conversation with you i enjoyed it brian many thanks good luck